Ah, uh, yes. That time Mauser sued America and won. Today we are talking about the model of 1903. My name is Sean, and welcome to the Armory. It's February 15th, 1898. The USS Maine has just been sunk in the Havana Harbor, and the Spanish got blamed for it. This kicked off the Spanish-American War. At this time, the Spanish were armed with the 1893 Spanish Mausers, and the Americans were mostly armed with the Craig Jorgensen. At that time, the Spanish Mauser was using the 7mm Mauser versus the Americans' 30-40 Craig. Both smokeless powder cartridges, but the Mauser had the advantage in both reloading and the fact that it was a flatter shooting bullet it had better accuracy and better range. Let's go over to the bench and take a quick look at the two different actions to see how they were loaded. All right, here we have an example of a Spanish Mauser that's a derivative of the 1893. This is a 1916 Spanish Mauser. And then we have a Craig here to show you what the Americans were up against when fighting the Spanish. So here, as an example, I don't have any 7mm stripper clips, but we have an 8mm Mauser stripper clip here. But the Spanish were utilizing stripper clips in their Mausers, whereas the Americans had to single load every single round into the Craig, of which then would close and would feed each individual round. As the bolt would close, the round would come out and into the chamber. And that was the major difference between the Spanish Mauser and the Craigs that the American soldiers were using. Now that we took a look at that, let's talk about this. The Battle of San Juan Hill was one of the most notable battles of the Spanish-American War, and the Americans quickly realized how they were outclassed. There were stories about ammo being dropped as they were trying to filter Craig's rifles, um, whereas the Spanish were using those stripper clips that we talked about. But long story short, the Americans on paper should not have won that battle, but they did due to failures of the Spanish. So what happened was, we, after the Battle of San Juan Hill and everything, the Americans took captured Spanish rifles and sent them back to the States to be looked over to find out what, what was going on. Why are these so much better? They were sent to the Springfield Armory, and that's when, quickly, new development of a rifle was started up. So let's talk about this. So the first prototype to come out of this was the model of 1900, of which I'm going to be putting up on the screen for you so you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, it was very close to the Mauser rifle that was put in trials in 1892 for the U.S. Army, which was rejected then for the Craig Jorgensen rifle. The M1900 incorporated aspects of both the 1893 and the Craig rifles into it, and this rifle also began the development of a new 30 caliber cartridge. So let's take a quick look at this. This is a real interesting design. It's got, the, it's got that straight stock that you're used to, very similar to on the 1903. Uh, it's got a nice size large front sight, but the one thing I do see missing in this photograph is the lack of rear sights. Again, this was only a prototype. Uh, it does have a, an external magazine, very similar to that of a Manlicker or a Carcano. Uh, which the next iteration we will see that gone. Um, other than that, we still have the bent bolt handle on the for the bolt and a very similar looking bolt to that of the 1903. Problems encountered with the M1900 were addressed and updated in the M1901 prototype. In this model, the action was very similar to the that of the Mauser action and incorporated a rimless cartridge. So let's take a look at this and see what we got here. Uh, from what I can see, there was two different versions, a long rifle version and a short rifle ver version of this. Uh, the M1902 was very similar to the M1901, 
with only minor changes to it. And it was approved for production, uh, but experiments with the M1902 found that with some modifications, a 24-inch barrel would work just as well as a 30-inch barrel, and this eliminated the need for two rifles, and only one rifle would be needed to be made for both the infantry and the cavalry. Thus, the 1903 is what that became. So let's take a look at the 1901. So here we have on the 1901, we still got that straight stock that we're going to see on the 1903. It eliminated that magazine, as I said, uh, that was protruding from the stock. So it's now all captivated inside. So it's got that internal box magazine, very similar Mauser bolt handle bolt. Uh, we got we do have rear sights on this one. Uh, it's got the traditional rear V-notch sights, and the, it's got a more traditional triangular front sight. It for the bayonet though, it has a rod type bayonet, which we will see in early models of the 1903. And as I said, the 1902 is very similar to this, with just minor changes to it. And it was originally what was supposed to be and it before the 1903. But the 1903 eliminated that need for that two-rifle system. So let's take a look and see what we got going on with the 1903. So now we finally come to the meat and potatoes of this video, the model of 1903. And it was originally chambered in the new 30-03 cartridge, or otherwise the 30 caliber cartridge of 1903. This round was a round nose round rimless cartridge, which with the round nose was common at the time. However, it was very short lived. Uh, issues arose from the 30 out 30 cartridge, such as severe erosion of the bore from the pressures. And it wouldn't be till 1906 when the 30 out 3 round was disregarded and a new cartridge, the 30 out 6, would be introduced. So let's take a look at the the original 1903. It looks nothing like the 1903 you are used to. So the original 1903 looks much different than that, and it is what we see in World War One and World War Two. For starters, the original 1903 had a straight stock with a thin band holding the stock and handguard to the front of the rifle. And we'll see this change on a 1918 dated 1903 that I personally own. The front side had holes drilled in it. And the purpose of that was for the sight guard to be able to hold on there. And it was fitted with a rod style bayonet. The rear sight was a ramp style rear sight, which was replaced with a more traditional sight later on. And now, since the 1903 was practically a copy of the Mauser, Mauser got word of this, looked at it, and sued the U.S. government for patent infringement and won $250,000 from the lawsuit, which is roughly $7.5 million now. By January of 1905, over 80,000 rifles had been produced at this point. It is also worth mentioning that in 1903, the United States Marine Corps experimented with a bullpup variant of the 1903. However, nothing came about this. As time went on and experiments and tests were conducted, changes were made to the 1903. In 1905, President Theodore Roosevelt wrote to the Secretary of War that the rod bayonet on the M1903 was too flimsy for combat. At that point, all rifles had to be retooled and fitted with a blade-style bayonet, which, is, which was dubbed the M1905 bayonet. Also, that's when the sights were then replaced for better accuracy, and few original M1903 with rod bayonets remain. In 1906, the most notable change of the M1903 took place. Rifles were rechambered for the new 30-06 cartridge, Otherwise, the 30 caliber of 1906. You see how they did that? Which was the new Spitzer bullet, which improved accuracy and is the basis for all modern rifle ammunition in military service. 
Also, the 30 out six was slightly shorter than the 30 out three round, and the 30 out six could be fired from the original chambering, but had decreased accuracy in those rifles. So all rifles were rebarreled and rechambered for the new round. By the time of the 1916 Pancho Villa expedition, the M1903 was the standard issue service rifle of the United States military. In 1909, some rifles were fitted with Maxim suppressors, and in 1910, 500 were ordered for recruit training. There is also an anecdotal evidence that some of the 1903s used during the Pancho Villa expedition were fitted with these suppressors, making them the first suppressed rifles used by the U.S. military in the field during World War I. Officers opposed suppressors since you could not use the bayonet with the suppressor, however. Now, on August 20th, 1910, at Sheepshead Bay Racetrack near New York City, an experiment was carried out to find out if you could shoot a gun from an aircraft. Lieutenant Jacob E. Fickle fired the 1903 at a 3-foot by 5-foot target from an altitude of 100 feet. And this is the first time... Well, we could say this is the first shots fired from an aircraft. Just prior to World War I, the U.S. government wanted to see what kind of advances people could make. So they sold some of the 1903s off to the civilian market, to inventors, to see what they can do with them. And some interesting designs have come about. You can see a lot of the videos of that on Forgotten Weapons. Uh, but one of the most notable was the Peterson device, which was a semi-automatic uh, 30 caliber conversion for the 1903 and we can cover that on another video at a later time in 1914 europe had entered into war and the u.s had no interest in getting involved at this time some u.s firearm manufacturers had been producing firearms for england and only springfield and rock island arsenal were manufacturing the m1903 by the time the united states entered into world war one 843,239 rifles had been produced. Also, the United States did not have enough 1903s for its troops in World War I, and instead of making Remington, Eddystone, and Winchester retool for the from the pattern 1914 to the Springfield 1903, they had them retool the 1914 for 30-06 over to 303 British and adopted the model of 1917, which we will cover in another video. World War I create, created many advancements in firearms technologies, and as trench warfare had become the new norm, rifles were modified with the idea to help increase safety of the soldier, such as stocks that folded down and periscopes for rifles. And one such advancement that was incorporated into other rifles is increased magazine capacity. In 1918, U.S. air crew were issued M1903 with 25-round fixed magazines now, during World War I, some very important issues were found in 1903 receivers. It was found that some of the receivers were becoming damaged due to improper heat treatment and could potentially be dangerous to the soldiers using them. And in December of 1917, pyrometers were installed to accurately measure temperatures during the forging process. For Springfield Armory, this change came around serial number 800,000, and for Rock Island Arsenal, the serial number was 285,507. Serial numbers above this are known as double heat treated. Between World War I and World War II, some 1903s went through a re-arsenal phase, where they were given new stocks and new barrels. Let's take a look at one of these rifles that was rebarreled in 1942. Alright, so here we have an example of our 1903. This particular 1903 was made in 1918 and was re-arsenaled, re-barreled in 1942 and restocked last year. You can check out my video on that. So let's take a look at this. So we're going to start off here at our front sight. We got that single blade front sight. I mean, to remove it, there's a screw here that holds it on. Remove it. You can change out that front sight, which you really don't need to, but if you did, this screw right here is what detents it. Uh, later models have different attachments on that, uh, such as the 1903A3, but let's continue. We got our front barrel band held on with a single screw here, your stacking swivel, 
move our way through we got our rear sight these rear sights get changed out on the uh, on the A3s and the A4s uh, the A3s they remove the rear sights they remove this foregrip make a solid foregrip all the way back here and from there the rear sights are moved here with a peep sight then we come to the bolt and we got that bent handle three position well two position safety you got your off on can't open it with it on and then you got your takedown to take the, to take your bolt out you've got your magazine disconnect here you set it to the middle and your bolt just comes right on out it's a very smooth bolt it's like it's like butter like glass it's very smooth but it's easy to easy to use the magazine disconnect is very easy to use so we put this back in you have the last round hold open So then we put the magazine disconnect on and you can see that magazine disconnect has, has kept it around from being able to come under because it's keeping the bolt forward just enough that you can only single load around. We turn the magazine disconnect off. You cannot put the bolt forward on an empty magazine at this point. That's where you grab your stripper clip, put your stripper clip in. And put your rounds in, and away you'd go. After World War I, development of a, a new firearm technology began, and advancements into the model of 1903 would seem unlikely. In the 1920s and 30s, M1903s were sent to U.S. allies in Central America, and in 1933, the Federal Bureau of Investigation acquired some 1903 rifles in response to the 1933 Kansas City Massacre. And prior to World War II, the M1903 had begun, began to be phased out by the M1 Grand, or Garand, however you want to say that. But in 1941, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, again, not enough M1 Grand rifles had been produced to issue to frontline troops, and Marines in the Pacific started off the fight with the 1903 and saw frontline combat in places such as Guadalcanal. At this time, Springfield Armory was focused on the manufacture of the M1, so future production of the 1903 was given to Remington Arms and Smith Corona Typewriter Company. You heard that right. A typewriter company was making firearms for the U.S. military. And here are some new changes that came about. Some of the rifles were made with scant stocks, while others had the older style straight stock. And the most notable change at this time was the, was the rear sight and handguard. To simplify the machining process, rear sights from the M1 carbine were fitted to the 1903 rifle on the receiver instead of on the barrel, thus the wood handguard would cover the entire barrel now. These rifles were then dubbed the 1903A3 or O3A3 also known as the A3 for short. And these rifles were issued to troops behind the lines to free up M1 grants for frontline use. And then the final model of the 1903 is the 1903A4, which sets itself apart as a sniper rifle. The front sight was removed and the rifle was fitted with a scope. And these rifles saw combat with U.S. snipers and marksmen from, around, from World War II into Vietnam. In short, the 1903 was America's copy of the Mauser to replace outdated technology and become one of the most famous rifles in American history. Today, you can still see 1903s in use by the U.S. Army drill team and in some ROTC and JROTC capacity. If you like firearm-related content or you wish to learn more, hit that like and subscribe button. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and if you wish to support what we do, visit us at thearmoryhub.com. If there's anything you want to see, let us know in the comments below. Links are in the description. We will see you next time at the Armory.